Perfect. So let me start uh, again for the ones that have just joined now. Welcome to our uh, Unleash the Day and the 93% session on uh, interviewing and self-love. I would like to um, introduce Lisa as our first speaker. Lisa is the co-founder and a CEO of uh, Alaria, which is uh, an amazing organization uh, focusing on diversity and inclusion. Lisa has done uh, a lot of research on unconscious bias, uh, all um, types of uh, unconscious bias in the workplace, but also um, in, let's say, the differences between males and females and how they perceive different things. And she will be telling us more about it just in a moment. And uh, she is also a very inspiring speaker and has a lot, of, um, a lot of public speaking experience. So Lisa, welcome to our uh, webinar. The second speaker that we have is Richard. Richard uh, Picard is the CEO of Inclusive uh, Search, which is a recruitment agency in London. And um, Richard's specialty is to uh, basically recruit talented uh, women in quite senior positions and be um, trying to introduce this dialogue around gender diversity and um, just basically bring women into inclusive places and not just only find the talent among, um, let's say, all the candidates out there, but also um, educate the, the different companies to, to see diversity and inclusion on their agenda and take that seriously. So welcome, Richard, to our webinar. And my name is Kate Surana. I am um, I'm here on behalf of Unleash Today. I am one of the co-authors together with Sarah Wagner. And we are, um, let's say, we are working on our fashion project next to our full-time job. And that is publishing our first book on uh, female empowerment and helping young ambitious women to transition between university and their first workplace. Um, we do that with our team of uh, 20 volunteers. I have not managed to fit everyone on this screen, but uh, you just get the idea. We have, we have this team that we have composed um, of different experts and nationalities, um, ethnic groups, and, and also uh, we also have two men on board. I'm very excited about that, that they are men among, uh, um, among us that are also supporting this very important cause. And we are, we are all working on publishing our first book on Amazon. We are doing the self-publishing process, uh, basically gathering all the experience and knowledge um, that Sarah and I, and also our 50 experts that are joining um, our uh, book have experienced and Richard and Lisa are among them and they will be sharing more on their stories, but much more um, today during the webinar. Just to give you a, a brief idea of the seven chapters that we cover. Um, it's basically, you can imagine it as a journey. When you join your first workplace, you might be daunted, it might be very difficult. And there are a lot of soft skills that young ambitious women are missing in today's environment and they're not uh, really taught at university. So we would like to introduce this handbook as a first um, um, ever handbook addressing young ambitious women that you can just open if you need some um, details on confidence or networking, um, interviewing and self-love that we are covering today. You will be able to quickly search for it and um, feel unleashed. That's the whole purpose because we would love to see all these uh, women to bring them bring their whole selves and authentic self to the to the workplace um, you can read all of that on our website but just a quick uh, snapshot of our experts again I have not managed to capture everyone because they're all um, on the website you can read all of their backgrounds and experience all these amazing professionals have um, spent time contributing with their story and most importantly lesson learned so you don't have to experience and go over this um, a difficult experience yourself but you can rather um, read and learn from our book now i would like to i would like to um 
give the floor to Lisa first to introduce herself a bit more in detail. And then Richard will tell us a bit more about himself and his, um, his passion um, for gender equality and diversity. And then we will kick off the session with interviewing skills. And then we will, be, then we will zoom on self-love and some kind of practical tips on how to achieve work-life balance. Lisa. Hello everyone, uh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, by way of introduction, yes, I'm Lisa McGill, I'm co-founder and CEO of Alaria, as you can see here on the slide, uh, but maybe a bit more about uh, what that means and then how I got here, if I may real quickly. Uh, Essentially, my organization focuses on measuring inclusion. We come into organizations and help them understand where they stand as it relates to inclusion, but where, more importantly, they should focus their resources to drive the change that needs to occur in their organization to make every employee feel as if they belong. And so um, our frameworks, our research is all um, been conducted with that in mind. How do we support organizations so that they know where to focus their resources, so that they know which initiatives to enact to be able to drive the right change, and so that they know that the needle is truly moving within their organizations and that they're not just focusing on performative um, kind of initiatives or work. And so um, we do that uh, on an ongoing basis uh, in workplaces. And then uh, we have a nonprofit as well that steps into different ecosystems, such as um, entrepreneurship or education or emergency management to kind of look at the same thing, looking at what is the um, access, what is the sense of equity and inclusion that exists within other um, ecosystems outside of just the workplace. And so that work is, is really key and important to us. Um, and, you know, just uh, by way of, uh, you know, beyond on just this moment of what I'm doing here, I want to just point out that, um, you know, I was, uh, I would say successful young. Um, I worked full time the entire time I was in college, which I think is a very important thing that you'll see um, kind of woven throughout the, my comments or my perspective in these topics that we're going to discuss today. Uh, I did not have the opportunity to go away to college. I was raising my siblings at that time. Apparently there's a wind blower outside right now too, so we'll mute we'll in just a moment. But um, I just want to say that, you know, every journey is different and uh, that you can be successful no matter your um, upbringing, no matter your context or conditions, and that it's really about not letting your outcomes, your goals, your dreams be swayed by anyone's limited um, views or expectations of you. And so um, I would just say that that's been a, a strong kind of um, vision and a reality of my life. And I look forward to sharing more of that with each of you. We are so glad to have you here, Lisa. And uh, thank you also uh, to be somehow matching with our slide. I didn't anticipate that, but it's a, it's a nice thought. It's perfect. <laughs> Richard, I should have gone for blue. You know, originally I had that in mind, but here we go. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, a lot, Kate. Um, so my name is Richard Pickard, and as Kate said, I run a recruitment firm in London called Inclusive Search. Um, I've been in recruitment for about 25 years, and for a large part of that journey, I was quite frustrated that most uh, clients and also most recruitment businesses um, they didn't, um, they didn't really have a passion for gender diversity. Um, and I guess I got introduced to some really inspirational female leaders who changed my mind at exactly the same time that my daughter was uh, starting university. Um, my daughter's now in her final year at university. And for the last two or three years, uh, I decided to start my own company and take the experience that I got and have a very specific mission to work with clients that want to have women in uh, senior and strategic roles. And then as Kate said, I also um, am quite an activist in um, uh, creating dialogue around gender diversity. I do a lot of events, I do a lot of business breakfasts, um, really just uh, trying, to, trying to get more and more dialogue going so that little by little we can see uh, change for the better. Amazing, Richard, and I'm I'm very delighted to have you here today as uh, I call uh, men that support these initiatives, the agents of change. And you are definitely in the category. And uh, I think all of us are very excited to hear more uh, tips from you uh, throughout the session. Now, if um, 
not much overdue. Let's jump straight into the first topic on um, interviewing. And Richard, let's start with you because you're the expert on, on uh, how to run interviews. And I have selected this particular picture because this uh, young, ambitious woman is uh, doing the interview uh, from home. And I think this might be the case for most of us, um, not just um, for because due to pandemic, but I personally believe it might be the case uh, going forward. Richard. What are your uh, tips and what would you like to share with them, with the rest um, about interviewing? Okay, so just to set the scene, I have got around about six or seven minutes of um, talking at you. Um, and there will be things if, that you, if you would like to take some notes, um, there'll, be, there'll be some things that you could scribble down as bullet points. Um, also, I, I know that we've got a, a, a limited crowd, so, um, if anybody has got any specific questions and I go too quickly, then I'm sure Kate will um, figure out a way that you can send questions over and, and we can answer them a little bit later. Exactly. So I'm going to ask you to think about three things, first of all, um, and they are research, preparation and delivery. So these are absolutely key for me to be successful in interviewing. So let's take a look at research. And also it goes without saying that if, if you're applying for graduate roles, this research should be done before you even complete the application form. So um, get it done then, or if you've already got an interview scheduled, then plan to devote several hours to the research stage. Um, one thing that I learned fairly quickly um, is think along the lines of the smartest candidate is simply the best prepared candidate. Um, can't always be true, but by the same token, you've got to act as though it is. And in my experience, normally the smartest person in the room is simply the person who's prepared the best. So for me, research has got four areas. So in this context, we start with the company's background. So this is you probably through websites, but um, understanding their core services or products, the geographies that they operate in, their office location, start off just by getting a really good um, 30,000 foot view of the business. In this climate, the next thing I would be looking at is how has COVID affected their business? So you've got some businesses that are absolutely thriving in this environment, but you've got others that are uh, mid and they're not badly affected. And for other companies, it's a nightmare. So I would definitely be wanting to have a clear interpretation of how has COVID affected their business? Think about what's their typical customer profile? Who are their main competitors in the market? And then think about um, what makes this company unique or what makes them stand out if they're not fully unique. Um, and the trick, if it is a trick, um, I would always be looking at press releases or I would be doing a Google search and clicking on the news tab, or I would be looking and reading quarterly reports and I would set myself the challenge of wanting to know the biggest piece of news that I could find out from that company in the past 12 months. I use this all the time in my recruitment career. I meet lots of clients for the first time and if you're not careful you end up in quite a transactional just an exchange of information and if you think about it that's a little bit like the interview scenario you're meeting somebody especially when you're doing it um, online so what you've really got to do is try and um, project your personality and, and try and find something that is authentically you and so what I would do is I would always know some hidden gem of information about the company and I would be waiting for a sentence when naturally I can expand upon that and say oh yeah that's really interesting because it reminds me of something that I noticed in your Q3 report that you'd launched a new product in and so long as it comes in naturally rather than an obvious attempt to just be a teacher's pet um, I think it can then lead to quite a genuine authentic exchange of ideas and it can change your interview from just a formal Q&A to a little bit more of a conversation. So uh, the next area is recruitment specifics. It is pretty straightforward, but obviously revisit the job description. Um, think carefully about what does the job involve me doing 
and then obviously you're trying to mirror back to what education or what courses have I taken or what experience have I got that is particularly relevant to that. So make sure you know the job inside out. And then think about culture and values. And again, you're back on the website now. Uh, but culture and values nowadays, they're not just buzzwords. A lot of companies will interview against them. So first of all, what are the company's values? Um, and the great thing about a, um, a, a video interview online is that it just enables you to cheat. And so just write them down um, and put them out of sight. And you don't need to memorize values nowadays for every single interview, um, but you should also put some thought into them. And later on, when we look at maybe some questions, you will sometimes find that they'll ask a version of a question and it will be probing, how do you align with one or more of the company's values? So uh, do, do scribble them down and have them within your eye shot but also you need to do a little bit more thinking about them as well. Think about how the company sees itself. Is it quite um, long established, huge corporate machine, quite formal, quite rigid, or is it a newer company, a younger company? Is it you know, quite dressed down and fast paced? Um, make sure that you've got a good feel for, um, for what the company is. Um, and how does the company get viewed externally as well? You can get customer reviews nowadays on pretty much every company. So just search those out on the, on the, on the web um, and read what, what customers are saying about the company. And then the final bit of that is think about why do you want to work for this company? And, and that should be thinking about the real reason as well, not just because you need a job and it pays money. Um, what, what, what is uh, your passion? What makes you happy? And, and then try and shape an authentic answer that mirrors something back to the company's values or its mission or the reasons why you'd want to work there. And then the final thing, and again, I give so much credit to this for my recruitment career, make sure that you're looking on LinkedIn. First of all, you want to be looking at people that have got a similar job to the job that you're applying for. So things like what degree subject have similar people studied? What unis did they go to? Um, what sort of internal progression do those people normally see? So one of the questions that we should expect is somebody saying something along the lines of, uh, where do you see yourself in three years or in five years? Well, why don't we take a look on LinkedIn and see where people that enter in this job where did they normally end up in three years? Where, where is the natural internal progression in the company? And that might just enable you to give a little bit of a smarter answer. Um, and if people leave the company externally, where do they normally go? What, what type of companies do they normally move on to? So uh, make sure that you've got all of that background information as well. So that's all researched, it's an awful lot. Um, but that's why, as I say, I would be doing hours and hours of research before I even put pen to paper on an application form or before I even start thinking about getting ready for an interview. The, the bit of the um, interview prep then, so let's assume that you've got an interview now, and this is really just housekeeping, it's just a checklist. So what to wear, um, make sure it's appropriate. And I don't mean appropriate um, in any way other than, is it right for the company? So I'll give you my story of, of getting it wrong. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to pitch for business with a new client and the new client was the head office of Deliveroo. I was very excited about it, very fast paced young company, but I was meeting the CFO, the chief financial officer. So he's on the board and he's quite senior and I didn't do my research well enough. And I made the mistake of deciding that because I was meeting a board member, I should wear a pinstripe suit and my best shirt and tie. I had a tie pin and cufflinks and everything. I went into the office. Um, I stood there and immediately was looking around thinking, this is quite a dressed down environment. Then I saw the person walking across the office towards me and I recognized his face from his LinkedIn profile. And he was in jeans and a fleece. And I thought, this is a nightmare. And as he walked towards me, he smiled. And then by the time he got to me, he was actually laughing. And by the time he shook my hand, he actually said to me, what have you come as? Um, now, luckily, we got on like a house on fire and they've actually been uh, one of my best clients for many years now. But it just shows you how much you can get it wrong. Um, 
and and yeah i was literally the only person smart in the office delivery was a total jeans and t-shirt environment with a thousand people working there and there's nobody older than 30 um and i literally just look like a, a a sort of a granddad from goldman sachs or something like that so yeah uh, get it get it right on what should you wear and if you don't know what to wear then ring the the hr department of who of whoever is you, you're interviewing with and ask them what the appropriate dress code would be uh simple stuff what's the background for your video especially if it's your bedroom make sure that you get that right what's the potential for interruption uh, check that your video and your audio is working properly and think about your secret notes because you can place notes all over the place that are going to be nice prompts and bullet points for what you want to say. Have you got a pen and paper handy for taking notes? And my final tip is use your phone and voice record every interview that you do. So what I believe in massively is listen back to what you've done and be brutal with your self-analysis and learn from everything that you do. Um, I did a recruitment pitch yesterday, and I've, as I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, I did a recruitment pitch yesterday for new business with a big client, and I had a voice recorder there, and I taped the whole pitch that I did and then sat and listened back to it and made notes around where could I improve, where didn't I like, uh, the way that I said something. And also sometimes you need that to be able to figure out how you answered a question and, and how it landed. Um, so I massively would encourage you to record all your interviews. Um, you know, the, this environment, it's a great opportunity for you to really, really learn from what you're doing. Uh, my final tip, and I know we're talking a bit about well-being later, um, but before you start the interview, five minutes before, close your eyes, breathe deeply for 30 seconds, slow everything down. I'm a big believer in um, the physical difference between feelings of terror versus feelings of excitement is nothing more than the story that you're telling yourself in your own mind. I think it's exactly the same. So slow everything down with a little bit of deep breathing and tell yourself that it's going to be a really positive experience because you're phenomenally well prepared and if you go in with that framing, um, I think you'll have a better experience. Um, final thing is delivery. Um, and delivery for me is largely about rehearsal. So remember what I said, smartest candidates usually just the best prepared candidate. So if you're gonna do a video interview, my advice is do a full dress rehearsal. Um, and if you're brave enough, literally get a friend to video interview you. You can download a bunch of typical interview questions off the internet. You can download some competency-based interviews off the internet. Um, get somebody to do that. And if not, then just do it yourself and just imagine you were being asked the question, read the question, and then go ahead and, and give your answer. You obviously can you can hone your answers then by watching yourself back doing that, or you can just voice record it. But also, most importantly, what you can start to do is practice your style. So things that I always imagine, I think that by video, you, you probably need to project your personality, maybe an extra 10 or 20% so that they feel that they're getting to the real you. So smile, project enthusiasm, um, be animated, use your hands. I mean, not don't go crazy, but you, you, you certainly can use your hands to show that you're, you, you know, that you're passionate. Uh, be polite, be well-mannered, don't be over-familiar, don't swear, um, don't fidget, and listen carefully to the question that you were asked and make sure that you answer that question. And my final, final bit, um, think about some killer answers to fairly predictable questions. So this starts really with, it's pretty likely that the beginning of the, the, the interview is gonna be, how are you today? So what are you gonna to say to set the tone? That first impression, what are you gonna say as tone, pace, excitement? Um, there's many ways that you can, you can do that. Um, you know, I, I, I'd be paraphrasing, but I, um, you know, my version of, of, of welcoming myself or introducing myself today was, hello, my name's Richard Picard. That, that, that's just how dull I am. You look at Lisa, um, 
her version was much more like, I am delighted or I'm thrilled to be here or I'm so excited to be here. You know, straight away I was jealous that she created that connection um, and mine's, you know, just totally. But think about that. That's the first thing that you're probably going to be asked is, well, how are you, how are you doing today? Um, think about something along the lines of you're probably going to be asked a version of a strengths and weaknesses question you're probably going to be asked some version of where do you see yourself in three years, five years. Um, you probably would be asked something about how do you work in a team? How do you look at challenges? How do you respond to feedback? Um, and probably something that tests in some way your alignment to values. And you probably will be asked some competency-based questions. And competency-based questions for anybody that's not got loads of work experience, they can be tricky. So this really does need um, practice. Um, and uh, I would just recommend that you make a note of uh, research what the STAR format is. Um, it's situation, task, action, result. And it's a structure for you to answer competency-based questions. Um, and rather than me talk about it for five or 10 minutes, uh, just take a look at what STAR format is. Um, and that's really, you want to try and already have a lot of that stuff pre-prepared. Um, think about competency-based questions from your uni, from uh, extracurricular stuff that you're doing. Um, and also be prepare that. Think about your achievements and interests outside of your studies. Um, and at the end of a, an interview, especially online, I think the important thing is that that they feel that they warm to you as a person and that they've met the real you rather than that this was some sort of transactional Q&A where they asked a few things, you answered a few things, and then we closed the call. Uh, projecting your authentic personality, I think, is probably the number one goal. Um, let me pause there. Richard, you have absolutely killed it. I think... <laughs> Uh, that those tips, if we were to apply all of them, we will all rock at the interviews. Uh, but I just want to emphasize it's about practicing it and and just trying out more interviews and more situations because you will kind of get more familiar in that process. Now let's hear from Lisa and her tips on interviewing. Lisa, what would you like to share with us? Yeah, that was all so wonderful, Richard. And um, I'm just going to apologize in advance. There's apparently somebody on my roof doing construction. So I don't know, bad timing today, but I out of my control. So we're just going to try to ignore it. If it gets too loud, I'll pause the mute. But um, I think that the thing that I will add, um, because Richard has already covered this so well, but like, um, it's just this nuance of, um, <laughs> sorry, you all, uh, this nuance of, you know, this early in your career, what are, what, how are you going to win over an interview? Uh, and, and, and what's unique about that? Because I think that what takes place in an interview evolves as you have a career story and expertise and um, you're just convincing them of fit and um, alignment. Um, but I think that um, I, we still look for a couple of things. And the first one is going to be like alignment and then passion. And I think that through uh, preparation and research, as Richard said, you can convey both of those very strongly. So um, I'll double down and support the idea that like research and practice can help you come across passionate about the business because you'll have information and context of like how they work and you know what they want to do and their goals as a company, um, their clients, these kinds of things that will come across as passion because you, you know you don't just hold that information for, for your own well-being. Um, alignment is similarly just going to be you convincing them that this is something you're interested in, something that you've been working towards, something that um, is aligned with where you see yourself in X years for the question that he mentioned earlier. Uh, and then finally, the thing that I would just lean on is, is this, um, I guess it's, it's kind of two sides of something. It's like, how do you convince them that you have experience when maybe you don't? Uh, and it's the, the tips I'll give there is the fact that you can come one. It's like you, you hold on to the framing of the conversation. There's, um, as you gain confidence around your career and what you want to be doing, you can reframe any question. You can reframe your story. You can reframe their needs um, based on what makes sense for you. And so having that confidence and practicing 
how to make sure that conversations go in a way where it's like, well, this is how I see us. This is how I see this role. This is how I feel my experience would support this. And, and just reframing everything so that it, it does align with what you're prepared to talk about or aligns with where you want them to see you in that organization is super, super powerful. To this day, even with like sales from clients, I'm and investors even, I'm constantly reframing how they see me and how they see our business and how they feel that we align. And that reframing conversation is probably the most powerful thing that you can um, practice uh, and, and preparation again helps you with that but then um, come with receipts so like the thing that is most impressive if you don't have um, traditional experience doing exactly what they want you to do or if you don't you know check all the boxes for the, the you know maybe they're saying you need you know a four-year degree and two years experience in this we want you to know this software and we want you to have worked at this type of company before those things like one just know that like the person writing that job description probably doesn't enjoy writing job descriptions and maybe isn't qualified or, or, or experienced writing job descriptions. So it may not actually matter. A lot of times we'll find that the, the requirements that are listed in job descriptions are not actually requirements. So just apply anyway, but also convince them that you have what they need, even if it's not that thing that's in the checkbox list. So like when I'm saying come with your receipts, I mean, build out the story, make it easy from like your profiles and your resume and such for them to link off and see that you have experience. So that could be things like letters of recommendation that speak to your leadership skills or that speak to the fact that you uh, work harder than anyone else in the room or um, that you accomplish some incredible goal, right? So letters from other people that are supporting your characteristics and personality. Um, things like certificates and classes and courses that align that you've completed. Instead of just saying that you completed them, write something up on Medium, write a blog post about what you learned there make it tangible, show that you've processed that information and it became something. So that could be showing a project, showing if you're, you know, if you're a designer, it's obviously like showing that work, but like if you, if it's a business kind of, you know, more strategy-based kind of thing, write a blog post about how that class changed the way you see X, you know, whatever it might be and link to that. And so that it's very clear that like, not only do I have experience by taking this class, but I've, I have thoughts, you know, around it. That is very powerful. Um, and then finally, same, same thing. It's like articles, blog posts, social media content. Like this is all a reality of, of the way that we exist these days. So having a voice around where you're headed in your career is super powerful as well. So I would just say, um, you know, step, don't be, don't be scared to like misstep or to like speak too early, build that voice early. Um, even if it's the week before your interview, like put something out there so that you can point to the fact that you have been thinking about this and are working towards it. But yeah, um, those are just the things I would add is just like convey passion. Your job is to convince them that you're aligned. Your story of experience is completely up to you. It's not the checkbox exercise from the job description. Come with whatever receipts and framing you can to convince them that you, you um, are going to be the, I hate the word fit to be honest, but I'm going to go with it for now. Uh, we can get into that a whole nother time. But um, yeah, I think that's what I would add. Thank you, Lisa. Again, great tips and I think very actionable ideas that you can already start working on now, even before the application process. I would just like to add a few tips also that we share in our upcoming book. And Sarah and I are um, writing on them in, in a bit more detail, but let me address three things. First one is a follow-up. Um, I would say that follow-up is the most powerful thing that will leave the interviewer with the impression after your interview and they will it can we would suggest that you follow up within the next 24 hours you want to make them a belief that um, you are still interested you enjoyed it you can summarize it quite briefly um, just what, what you let's say what were the some points that that you discussed if there was something that you didn't know during the interview you can respond to that uh, question in a follow-up my uh, biggest weakness uh, was that I used to write huge follow-up emails and then, uh, then it would actually, you know, I would try to like overdo it. Please don't do that because otherwise you send massive emails and they're just thinking, oh my God, you know, they're so desperate. Uh, you don't want to convey that message. So a short, concise follow-up email to each individual personally uh, will be excellent. If you can't get their email, send them a message on LinkedIn. Don't just connect, but personalize the connection. Write down, hi, um, 
Richard, or hi Lisa, it was really nice to speak to you today during the interview. I really enjoy discussing X and I look forward to staying in touch or I look forward to hearing about the next steps. You know, make it very simple, short, to the point. If they accept your connection, say, thank you for accepting the connection. But, you know, don't, don't like say, oh, I'm a great candidate and I am perfect for this job. Like, I know that this, this is, when I was a graduate, I always felt that I need to like oversell myself. You start to sound desperate. Don't do that. You want to really uh, stick to your strengths and um, just, just kind of convey them in a, in a simple message. So that's one on follow-up. Uh, second, and Richard already touched on this, when they ask you a question, take a moment and think about the answer. Don't just immediately respond because there are a lot of people and it's just not about interviews, but they just say something which is not related to the question at all. And, and it gets frustrating for the interviewer because either they feel like you're not listening and you're not really getting in um, the you're not really answering the question and they are not hearing what A always wants to hear because that's the reason why they're asking the question. And two, you just keep rambling on about something else that they're not really interested in. So um, just make sure that you listen to the question. And if you don't understand and you need a bit of time, say, if I understand you correctly, you're asking me about X, Y, and Z. Is that right? You see, I just got like five, six seconds to think about my answer. And um, the last tip that I would also share, and it's something that we discuss um, um, in our networking chapter, but also um, in the confidence chapter, when um, they ask you about something, just don't keep talking uh, like you don't, don't give them a 30 minute presentation. You can read from the person and especially when you see them if they're so interested or they're looking up or down they usually probably get a bit bored so you you need to read the body language it's very difficult to do it over the computer it's much easier to do it in person but know when to stop it's always good to for instance talk for a bit and then answer the question and say would you like me to elaborate on this a bit further because you don't want the worst thing and i and from my experience i also of course, I have been an interviewee, but I've been an interviewer because I, uh, in my previous role, I also um, um, covered the HR function. Um, so I just the, one of the worst things uh, and the most draining experience I've ever had is that when a person would come there and keep talking for 30 minutes and I would not know how to stop the chat. Uh, so really think about it. How, how do you convey yourself, how you are going to present yourself in the most authentic way, but also respect the space and definitely respect their time. If they say that they need to finish at four, don't keep talking uh, so they can't really escape the meeting. And, um, and the last tip that I would share is have very good questions. Prepared, study questions, something very targeted on each person and try to balance it um, uh, if you have three or four interviewers, you would like to have a small question for each so uh, you don't make them feel excluded. Um, so those are tips from me. I would like to hear if anyone has any questions uh, at this stage, please type them in the chat. Uh, Richard and Lisa, would you like to add anything else while we are waiting for the questions? I liked what Lisa said a lot. Um, and the other thing I would add then um, is... If you, if, if you have time, and th this could be more effective if you say in your second year rather than in your final year, um, reach out to people on LinkedIn and look for uh, mentors or look for buddies, um, you know, people that are doing the job that you want to do. I've been astonished at how generous people are on LinkedIn. Um, most people that are <coughs> successful they, especially nowadays, they really understand the, the concept of giving back. Um, and if you get somebody smart that just sends you a really genuine, authentic message, which says, you know, I wonder if you'd have a virtual coffee with me because I'd be so excited to do the job that you do or something. The, the power of you just reaching out to people and, and just being enough to 
this is where I am, this is where I'd love to be, any help that you could offer, even if it's just 15 minutes that I could pick your brains, most people will say yes. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is the power of community as well. You know, um, look for look for groups, look for other people that are, you know, maybe even you could just, you know, connect with other students or, um, but the power of community is, is really, really important. Um, and it's something that I've learned a, a lot through the diversity work that I've been doing. The number of um, uh, amazing um, females that realize that there isn't enough females that are talking to each other and inspiring each other. And so they create a community and um, it blossoms into something amazing. Um, and I, you were all here when I was um, chatting at the beginning about the, the, the lady that I interviewed um, who set up coding black females for black females who are working in tech. She worked in it for eight years. She never met a black female. So she just decided actually what she did was she watched the movie um, Hidden Figures um, and it was so powerful to her that she decided that she would set up a community that night. Um, and she created something that now is a couple of thousand people around the world who are all black women that are working in tech. And every two weeks they come together online and they do events where they share ideas and they upskill each other. So look for communities that you can, that you can become a part of and, and you can get support from other people as well. Amazing. I think we can continue with the great tips both from Richard and Lisa for another hour, but I'm conscious of the time. Um, and there is one question just that we will pick this up, but then we will move to the, to our second topic, which is uh, well-being, self-love and how to find your work balance. Now let's pick this question up before we move on. Uh, the question is from Anne-Marie. Is it helpful to post long posts directly on LinkedIn or rather uh, on Medium uh, and just link to them? Sorry, what was the, I didn't quite catch the is it Is it helpful to post longer posts directly on LinkedIn or rather, I guess, uh, post somewhere else and uh, link that article to LinkedIn? Yeah, I would probably, me personally, I would probably do that. I would, I, I love Lisa's idea of, um, you know, write blogs. Um, and uh, I'd probably use a, a platform that, you know, that, that connects with um, a slightly different audience. I think, I think what you've got to remember on LinkedIn is that it's a professional um, networking site and most people are reasonably time short. And so uh, you can write articles on LinkedIn though, of course, and then, um, you, you know, you just have a very short post that introduces it. I mean, the, the article that I wrote today, um, I think it was a, a nine minute read, um, but it's just got a very short post to introduce it. And it's, uh, you know, use, use photos as well. Anything that doesn't have a photo never gets looked at by anybody. Um, so I, I, yeah, you could, you could do either, but certainly don't, don't fill the text box on on a post on LinkedIn. Don't fill that with the maximum number of characters. I think it allows you to write something like 1500 characters or something. Nobody has got the time to read 1500 mm -hmm. uh, characters, but um, it's very clever now as LinkedIn in that it'll, it'll say that the number of minutes it takes to read your post. And, and if somebody has got interest, they might read the whole thing. Excellent. Yeah, even now, I often uh, will write articles and publish the original content on LinkedIn or some, or I'm sorry, on Medium or somewhere else. And then on LinkedIn, I'll either post and like link to that article, or you can create an actual blog on LinkedIn, but you don't have to put the whole thing there. So at least then you're like targeting your traffic and it's there for accessibility purposes, but then make it very clear in the LinkedIn post that this was originally published on Medium, like, or wherever it might have been published, and you can read the rest of it here. Um, and so I would just use LinkedIn as more of like a way of sharing and um, getting it in front of the audience wherever they're at. But it, the platform of which you originally published doesn't matter as much as making sure that you own that content and know where to find it at all times. Great. Let's move to our second topic. And here we have a lovely illustration from our, um, our illustrator at Unleash Today. And this young, ambitious woman um, is trying to, you know, manage her successful career, but also she wants to stay well. Lisa, 
could you share some uh, tips with the audience on how to love yourself and how to find these habits that you introduce in your day-to-day -day routine? Yes. And um, when I realized that we were talking about this, I was kind of, um, it was kind of one of those things where it's like, I need to do this because you, um, you, people say you like learn through teaching, right? And it's like, I needed these reminders, particularly right now in this stressful week in the United States. Um, I needed these reminders to be, um, to my, for myself even. Uh, and it's something that I feel like I don't even have all the answers to. So I just want to like disclaimer anything I say, this is a journey, we're all figuring it out. Um, but I'd like to start by just kind of uh, painting a bit of a picture of, of myself 15 years ago. <laughs> um, and then I, I will um, point to a couple of lessons I learned um, about work-life balance and I promise it won't be too long. But uh, yeah, I just, I would like you to imagine, uh, you know, I'm for transparency's sake, 36 years old. So um, I started working in finance when I was 19. And so about 17 years ago. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I was uh, going to school full time. I was working actually full time and another part time job at the time and raising my siblings. Um, I actually nowadays have no idea how I did all of that at the same time. It makes no sense to me, but you make things happen when you have to, right? And um, one thing that I, I recognize now as I reflect back on those years of my earliest career and at that time of university uh, is that. During that time, I, sorry, you all, I don't even know what to do about this. Um, I knew that like, I was, I had this like chip on my shoulder. I just knew that like my goal or my, my um, drive was tied to the fact that I didn't like that people underestimated me based on my story and my family's story. Um, I was out to prove them wrong. I was going to accomplish these things. I was going to overcome the barriers. Uh, and, and that really served me well for a number of years. Um, but the reality is that where it led to me being just five years later, let's say I was, I was 24 years old. I had um, gone through two acquisitions in the financial services space. I had moved to Chicago. I was then VP of sales and marketing for a large broker dealer. Um, I was one of the only women in the room um, almost always. And it was definitely the youngest person in the room managing people on average, you know, double my age. And so I was 24 and what, that all sounds great when I like rattle it off like that. But the reality is, is at that very moment, I had this reflection where it was like, I set all these, these aggressive goals for myself. I'm 24 and I don't know what to do next. <laughs> it's like, what, what now? Um, like I felt like I had run out of goals or insight into where to go next. And so there's three lessons in this story that I would like you to take away and hopefully not learn the way that I learned them. And the first one is, um, I just want to be clear and say that um, it's a really for unfortunate series of words that have been put together, work-life balance. I absolutely hate it because the reality is that like work-life balance isn't, isn't the goal and it's actually not even all that possible. Um, so the reality is that you, what we're aiming for is like integration, figuring out how you want to, and it's, it's your own personal story, how you want to navigate the, 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 <laughs> the balance between work and life, right? But like the reality is work is life. <laughs> so it's not life. It's the idea is like, how do you want to spend your time? How do you want to divide that up? What percentage of your energy do you want to go towards work? And finding a way to support you in that once you discover what that you know balance for you looks like, okay? Um, but the idea that like life and work are separate is not the reality because you spend so many hours at work. It is going to be a huge part of your life and it's going to inform what you're able to do for the rest of the hours of your day um, and how you feel in those hours, your financial stability, all of these different things. And so separating them is just not possible. Um, the second lesson I just would like to say is that your work cannot be your full story. It cannot be your full identity. Um, I made that mistake in my early twenties where I, that's all I, I would just, I worked and that's, I worked so much and so hard because I had these aggressive goals. And I, you know, I knew that if I, you know, was climbing the ladder as fast as I could, that I was like, you know, that felt good to me. That's, that was how I um, was validated at the moment. But the reality is that leaves you in a place where it's short lived one, um, two, it's not, it's not deep enough to to sustain you long term and it's it's going to get boring and it's going to get frustrating and you're going to lose um, steam you're going to lose interest you have to have other things in life to allow work to 
bring you a bit of joy or bring you, even if it's just a job and you're just getting financial stability from it, like what is the rest of your story? Who are you without work? And I, I would encourage each of you to think through that. You know, who, who am I going to be not without my career? Like career aside, definitely a story we all need to figure out. It's going to be a moving target, I promise. <laughs> Unless you're my sister who has known she wanted to be a veterinarian since she was six and is actually a veterinarian and spent you know, too many years in college um, trying to get there and is now successfully doing that. I just, I don't know anyone else that has like not had a career that's been a moving target. You evolve, you discover new careers, you discover new talents, you, um, the, the world evolves so that there are new jobs and new opportunities, right? And so you have to be able to be nimble and be willing to adjust that story. But who are you outside of that story is really important as well. And so I want you to think on that. And then finally, um, the idea of work-life balance, the thing that, you know, in our work, so in diversity and inclusion, we're often looking at what can we do to make the employees of an organization do their best work? Like, what do they need to be able to do that? And so when we're looking at this bucket of work-life balance, the reality is that everybody works best or delivers their best work under different conditions, under different working styles, at different times of the day. And so you, um, your job in your early career, I think is a couple of things. It's one, it's not like me. It wasn't, it's not to prove everybody wrong. <laughs> just, just go ahead and let that one go if you can. But um, your job is actually to learn as much as you can. Learn as many skills, learn as much about you and how you work, learn as much about your interests, learn as much about how you want to exist in this world. That is what your early career should be about, is just learning and learning as much as possible and understanding not only yourself, but where you want to go and how you want um, your personal life and career life to align. But it's also um, the fact that when we're all working in different ways, yes, you may particularly early in your career not have the ability to say, like me, I'm not a morning person. My whole team knows this. And like, they apologize if they put something on my calendar before 9 a.m. because they know it's like not good for anyone. Like that's just a real, a real talk about me, right? It's like, they know, everyone knows I'm not a morning person. And I'm in a place in my career now where it's like, I can, I can navigate that so that I'm able to say, we all know that like the morning meetings aren't the best for me. Like, let's just not do that to anyone. Um, and so you may not have that flexibility, but starting to build that awareness of like how and when you work best is so, so important. So um, for me, you know, I have been working remote for eight years. I love working remote. Um, I love having flexibility in my schedule. I am not a morning person, as I mentioned, but I will work, you know, 12, 14 hour days, not uncommon, but at the same time, I may also take Thursday and just go hiking for eight hours because that's, that's the balance. That's how balance works in my life. It's like, I, I need to check out and like be outdoors away from my screen for like a good chunk of time. So I'll go hiking, I'll go camping. When, when travel was a thing, I would disappear for two weeks and go, you know, explore a country. Um, my extreme on and off is, is, is how I work best, but that may not be how you work best. So understanding whether you like to be in groups of people, working on your own, working in an office, working at home, if you're able to be disciplined in your routine at home is, is a key one. But also, you know, what hours you work best? When do you need breaks? Like how often do you need to like step away and take a bite of, you know, food, <laughs> whatever it might be. These things that you learn about yourself are actually more important than so many of the skills that you'll learn along your career. And so when I'm thinking of taking care of yourself, um, just to kind of wrap up here, um, and you know, thinking of work-life balance, my, my biggest thing is just to urge you to, to, to be on that journey of understanding yourself and how you best work and what work is in, in the big picture of your life to you. He said there were some very powerful words and I have personally learned a lot from your story. So hopefully the rest uh, of the audience has uh, also taken a lot on board. Richard, and uh, by the way, I just want to apologize for everyone that we are running a little bit late. If you're still keen to hear um, uh, more tips to stay on. Um, and Richard is going to share his uh, tips and tricks on work-life balance, if there is one, or life, life balance, Richard. Yeah, I, um, I won't take too long as we're running over, and Lisa was amazing. Um, I agree with so much of it. So um, I definitely agree that um, understanding yourself is actually a technique, 
and you should invest in learning how to do that and you should put as much time into figuring yourself out but don't just imagine that it will happen just naturally just one day you'll suddenly wake up and you know yourself really well you need to invest in yourself and figure yourself out so i agree with that i think in the early stages of your career it's totally natural to think about nothing but progression and financial goals um, but I think you can control that. That's okay with your career. And once you get to your 30s, you probably will, you know, figure, figure some more things out. But a couple of tips that I would give you. Um, I divide my life into three areas, physical and mental health, my relationships with people, and uh, my investment in either my career or my skills. So those are three distinct areas. And when I get up in the morning, I, I create an intention for that day. And it's in one of those three areas. And that means it doesn't have to be about career and skills development. It can be, I want a better relationship with my partner or my mother or my dog or whatever. It can, it can be anything. Um, it might be that I just want to meditate or it might be that I want to do, you know, my, my goal is incremental change i just want to make myself a little bit better in one of those areas today than i was yesterday so i set very very small goals um the bigger goals i uh, set through a vision board and again know yourself do you prefer words or inspirational quotes or do you like pictures or do you like the specific goal but spend time thinking about what what is important to you or what would you like to achieve in the next three months and six months and then five years and then in some way visualize that on some board so that you can keep revisiting that or even every single day you can look at it and allow it to inspire you in some way but um headline things exercise eat healthy take care of yourself um, figure out how you de-stress. Um, you know, what, did, what do you need to do when life's getting on top of you? That's a real trick. You, you know, do you need to work out or do you need to read a book or do you need to go hiking? Um, or do you need to ring your best friend and just let it all out or wh whatever it is, figure out how you, um, how you de-stress and, and learn the lesson of glass half full. It's a bit like what I was saying before about, the, the, the physical um, symptoms of going on a roller coaster and um, being just about to have an accident, it feels almost identical. Um, it, the, the difference between terror and excitement is so, so close. It is how you frame it in your own mind. So you can make everything a drama if you want, or you can simply look at challenges that you hit in life and think, mm, that's quite exciting change of direction but it's an opportunity for me to learn something new and it's the story that you're telling yourself and I think when we're you know until you've got 10 years life experience under your belt work in the work environment you just miss that trick and you just believe that everybody else is a genius and that you're the idiot in the room and it just isn't true um, in fact it's often the reverse um, I think the other thing that I would say is um, do look into a little bit to do with mindfulness and meditation and gratitude. When I did that, I was a little bit like Lisa. I was working 14 hours a day. I didn't have time for any of that because I was so busy. Um, and when I started doing things like waking up in the morning and thinking of three things that I was grateful for, um, I even thought, and it didn't feel natural at all, but I forced myself to get a journal and write those things down. Um, think about three things that you appreciate about yourself things like that little tricks like that and when you mess things up don't beat yourself up simply think um what can i learn from this experience be be kind to yourself um but take the learning from experiences and most importantly uh be kinder to other people that will um make you feel much much better just by interacting with the world in a in a more kind way. That's all I've got. Richard, <laughs> as always, 
I just want to reiterate that uh, if I knew all of this when I was leaving university or still being at university, my life would have been much easier and I would have spent less time being frustrated, angry, crying or all sorts. Just realize that it's you, your unique self and you know, it's, it's just, if you're different and I've always thought of myself that I'm the old one, no, it's actually, it's an advantage. You bring something new to the party and you bring this new energy um, to the team, your class or, or, you know, your friendship or partnership. So, and of course to the new firm. So I just want to reiterate, don't beat yourself up, be kind to yourself. And um, there are more tips on how to deal with stressful situations, how to um, do mindfulness, meditation, affirmations also were mentioned here today. We write uh, about all of this in our upcoming book and um, you will be able to read it in early 2021. Having said that, um, also I would like to thank um, Aid for her great comments in the chat. If there is anyone else that would like to raise any questions or anything else that they would like to address, um, please uh, uh, bring it into the chat box. I, in the meantime, while you are um, writing your exciting questions, I would like to invite you all to uh, subscribe to our newsletter. We are sending out uh, all sorts of events, also inspirational quotes and uh, other motivational material through the newsletter, but also you can see it on the website. Um, on our Instagram, I mean, this is something that really keeps me going in the morning, uh, is there are a lot of uh, inspirational quotes, and that's also how Sarah and I basically started this journey, that we felt so inspired by something positive, or if I have a bit of a rough day, you know, just watch a nice, inspiring, motivating video to just kind of get yourself back on track. So I hope you will be able to find more on our, on our social media and also on our website. Questions uh, or any additions from Richard and Lisa? No, I think in the, in the interest of running over time, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody's got, but I'd better not start talking anymore. I will just also share um, Richard's and Lisa's details. So as we said, it's very good to follow up, not just after interview, but uh, also after events or any other personal connection that you have made during the day. So here are their LinkedIn pages. Feel free to also drop uh, uh, your personal message or question to our uh, email address at info at Unleash Today. And I would also like to greatly thank uh, the 93% Club for um, co-hosting this event with us because it was, uh, and again, an excellent um, session on other skills that are important uh, in our lives. And uh, I guess we will, we will end it here. Rich. Can I say just one last thing? Yes. You just reminded me when you when you showed my link. Um, Emma and Anne-Marie, just, um, I, I just extend the invitation to you that in the spirit of what I just said, um, if in any way my community would be useful to you, I, I'm uh, incredibly well connected on LinkedIn. Um, and if you would like to reach out and connect with me and let me know what career you are thinking of, of going into, um, I'd be more than happy to connect you with people in my own network that can help you. Um, I don't know if it'd be um, worth its weight in gold, but um, but I, I'm I'm I, I think you know I'd, I'd be more than happy to do it. So just I'll extend the invitation to you. Excellent. You see, you're already networking here in the live session. Love it. And just to add on that, I have met Richard and Lisa on LinkedIn. Sarah and I connected um, and with basically both of our experts and most of our experts contributing to the book. Disclaimer, we have never seen each other in person, but we have made a great connection over Zoom multiple times. So it works. This is a proof of it. And the same with the 93% Club. So I am absolutely also delighted to help you in any way um, uh, I can personally, but also our team has a lot of experience. A lot of other people have gone through the same um, situation. So just feel free to reach out. We are all very happy to support you.
Um, I guess the same, of course, goes for Lisa. So um, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, I would like to thank you both. Thank you, Lisa and Richard, for uh, joining us, but also thank you all for coming to our webinar. It's great to have you tonight, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck. Bye. Bye.